donut eaters to ECGR 4161-5196, MEGR 4127, Introduction to Robotics, Lecture Number 9. We are going to briefly touch on systems engineering again, since we know that this is something that's going to show up on your exam. So I want you to start thinking about if we are going to have an example of a problem, all right? Uh, let's say I am going to design a vehicle. And as a matter of fact, this is the beginning of Zapatabot. So my vehicle will travel rough terrain pulling a trailer with instrumentation. And it's going to travel in a, uh, a very, um, what's the best way to put it, very lawnmower-like fashion. Is there anybody who is not familiar with how one would cut a lawn? All right, so everybody's familiar with that? I bet money that Susie up there, I bet you you cut the lawn as a kid, right? Never. Never? Are you serious? Maybe once in like the little riding ones. Oh, that's not fair. Well, you still had to do the same concept, right? Yeah, yeah. The same concept where you have a, a space and you want to go back and forth and back and forth. Maybe vacuuming could be another. Uh, Rasper's can. Hey, what? Rasper's can. Uh, I want to go in something that's a little bit more non-technical. All right, so there are there are occasional four inch and larger trees that must be avoided. So, your task is to identify parts and design. The whole aspect of this is that you must use systems engineering Reduction. And again, system engineering would be, reduction would be categorizing main categories and then identifying the requirements for those. So, let's look at, oh, and uh, here I'm going to say, uh, here is my robotic vehicle. And I'll just identify it as a block with wheels, and my robotic vehicle is going to pull behind it a trailer and the whole concept is as this goes through this trailer is going to be 48 inches wide and uh, we can pretty much assure that there's going to be 72 inches from the back of the trailer to the back of the uh, vehicle. Now, why do we need this? I have started work on a project called Zapatabot, which will actually go up and down a field, pulling behind this trailer. And inside this trailer, the instruments are ground penetrating <coughs> radar, looking for unexploded ordinances. Ordinances means what? Bombs. Bombs. And also shrapnel. The whole use of this is 
Fort Bragg, are you familiar with where Fort Bragg is in, uh, in eastern North Carolina? Is an army base, and they actually use some of the space there for practice bombing runs during World War II. And now they're wanting to convert some of that land to old bombing ranges to something else. Well, wouldn't that be really bad if they converted it to barracks? And in the process of building, they dug up and detonated some old World War II era explosive. So they have a desire to go over this old bombing range field and look for these things. What they will do, and, and very often, it's, you can walk over the area and not, not uh, uh, detonate anything. But they still want to find it with a piece of instrumentation because, again, there's also shrapnel that they want to pick up from underneath the ground. They want to characterize anything that's huge, that's underneath there that would be unexploded, and then shrapnel that's uh, fairly big, no deeper than three feet. So the goal of this systems engineering reduction is to actually identify what needs to be in the robotic vehicle. Because even though it's not necessarily dangerous, it's extremely monotonous, and they want to ensure that they cover every single square centimeter of that field without missing any, any space between rows. So let's do a quick bit of reduction and say for this system, and the system is just going to be this robotic vehicle right here. Not the instrumentation. Not the instrumentation in this little vehicle over here. Let's just assume that this instrumentation has its own GPS, has its own sensors, has its own computer which is recording everything that it reads. All you have to worry about is dragging that trailer. Is it autonomous or autonomous? Say that louder. Is it autonomous or autonomous? Oh, yes, and it's also autonomous. It's an autonomous robotic vehicle. And the terrain it's traveling in is lightly hilly, no lakes, but it has trees that are six inch, or I'm sorry, four inches in diameter and wider. Anything greater or less than four inches in diameter have been cleared away with some sort of bushwhacker or equipment and everything dragged away. So the center of gravity tipping isn't an issue. So the center of gravity tipping is not an issue. Uh, falling into ruts is not an issue. Um, in general, no worry about walls or cliffs or anything like that. So, I'll tell you what, I'll make this a quick assignment. What are the major subcategories of all of these. Remember we started out with an airplane and we identified this and this and this and this and this. But assume that this is going to be a, a one-off, all right? We're only going to do one of these vehicles. You don't need to do multiple ones, so you don't need documentation on how to repair it. You don't need uh, to train anybody. So it's just, just the vehicle itself. I want you and your lab partner to give me at least five of these subcategories that we have to worry about in our system design. All right, spend some time doing that. You can pause. All right, we're back, and here's one example. Would you like to share it with the class? Uh, sure. So we have our vehicle, which obviously is going to require movement. So we've got the drive train, chassis, and suspension over the environment. We're going to need sensors. I apologize for kind of jumping on to start listing sensors, but sensors for you know bomb detection, obviously, not uh, related to trees and other sort of things. Controls and communications in order to you know uh, program it in order to make sure it runs how it's supposed to. Power source because I'm sure we can't drag a big wire behind a floating pool wall. Really? I, I mean, maybe we can. Okay. Well, it's, it's real I'll heavy and it's a, it's a ordinance. Okay, I'll think about that. All right. Thank you very much. You should grab that and yours. You came up? Yeah. Your lab partner was a little bit too, uh, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll say shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Shy, lazy. Shy, lazy, okay. Major um, subcategories. Yeah, we didn't make a 
pretty diagram or anything, but obviously you have uh, navigation, doing uh, different autonomous activities, steering, similar to his drivetrain, orientation, so you know where you're at, obviously like GPS, and so. um, obstacle avoidance, you have many visits in uh, overall sensors categories. Power, um, different electrical stuff, you know, you have all the wires running, um, and communication, we're thinking possibly using a uh, CAN network, might be like, we get kind of specific. All right. Now, uh, thank you very much. Now, again, the uh, the major uh, concept here is you took an entire big problem and you broke it down to uh, um, something a little bit more detailed. And then, as we saw in another group, you break it out even further. So now, when you're identifying your requirements. Let me say, for example, you came up with some areas such as uh, vehicle, uh, vehicle, and I'm just talking like the chassis and wheels and stuff like that. Uh, and then powertrain, I think we saw something like that earlier. And then the control system. And then the uh, location services. That could be something along the lines of GPS, because since you need to be very precise, can you use your typical GPS that you find in automobiles? Not really, because that's not precise enough. In fact, how is it that the automobile kind of knows exactly, or the automobile GPS knows exactly where it is? Cell phone towers. We hear, I hear Pattern matching. Pattern matching because of what? Obviously, if you're a vehicle and the GPS is reading something, it makes the assumption you're actually on a road. And so it shows you on the road because otherwise the alternative would be you would be in a ditch 60 feet somewhere off, uh, maybe in a swamp or something like that. And it's not pretty typical if you're going 60 miles an hour that you're driving through a swamp. So they make some assumptions and corrections. But if you're doing something like this, you need it to be precise. And there are specific equipment and services that will do that. And then one thing I also mentioned, you also have additional sensors because you need to avoid obstacles like a tree. So with this, the next assignment is you need to further reduce I didn't spell it right. Can't see. There we go. So you are to further reduce the control system, let's say. and to give it some requirements. So let's take a look at one example of a requirement that you should, uh, that you can have. Oh, you know what, I'm gonna give a, uh, I'm just gonna give some requirements for the vehicle first. We can look at those as an example, and then your assignment will be to find some for the control system. So, um, So this is in the sub-area of vehicle. The vehicle shall be able to, shall, again there's a key word, be able to run in snow, rain, and sun. Will you post this on Moodle? Oh yeah, this, uh, all my notes are on Moodle right now. Even the system engineering ones are up there if you didn't look. Now why is this important to say stuff like snow and rain and sun? Waterproofing. Waterproofing? No, not traction. Traction? Why would I even mention something like sun? 
Sunburn. <laughs> what was that somebody up front? Overheat. Overheat? Could interfere with sensors. Ah, could interfere with sensors too. LIDAR. Because there's a sensor like LIDAR where if the sun is coming directly in, you're not seeing anything. And in fact, in the uh, DARPA Grand Challenges, uh, there were some problems that people didn't anticipate uh, because they assumed that they would be running during the major part of the day and then the race started really late, like 1 o'clock, and as time went on and the sun went down and vehicles started driving into the sun, they lost it. They couldn't find anything. That's why the very first DARPA Grand Challenge, nobody finished. So, uh, let's see. Hey, another one, vehicle. Uh, the vehicle shall operate. Did I spell that right? Okay. And the temperature range of negative 10 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius. Now, one thing I didn't also tell you is that one of the reasons why I got an initial grant to work on Zapatabot was because they, uh, they hired the people who did the DARPA Grant Challenge from Carnegie Mellon, and Carnegie Mellon charged them um, half a million dollars for doing some work that did this very thing, except out in a desert setting. And oh, by the way, the reason that it was uh, autonomous was because the area was contaminated with radioactivity, and you did, really didn't want people out there in the radioactivity in the field that had radioactivity. And so uh, the range out there in the desert, when it gets really hot, could be 60 degrees C. But at night, when it runs, it can get pretty cold in the desert. And uh, let's see, well, power. How, how did they uh, re refuel it or recharge it? Uh, Powertrain. The vehicle shall operate for eight hours continuously. So obviously, when they have a requirement like this, that they have to figure out that you're running for eight hours without having to refuel or recharge a battery. It was supposed to drive back to a safe area, whereas they could refuel it. And I believe it was gasoline-based. And since they were not accelerating tremendously, the uh, they were, and they were able to put an extra tank on it and just run for the eight hours. Because how, how long can you drive for? on a typical tank of gas. Yeah. So, so they basically had to back off the, the distance from or the worst case and get back to the state. Correct. And uh, maybe another one, the vehicle can be powered by gasoline or electricity, so you're not actually limiting when you're doing the design. So your assignment right now is to write uh, five good requirements for the control system. So do you have uh, any questions about the operation of this before we, uh, we have you work on that? All right, being done. Go to it. All right. The uh, the request was show me uh, show me the money. Show me uh, five requirements on the control system. So just go ahead and put it on the camera and uh, speak to it. Speak loudly so they can hear you. 
Uh, that's not five, but I'll, I'll take what I can get. <laughs> all right, the trail system requirements that we went after was, um, first of all, there was going to be trees in the field, so we needed something to uh, detect obstacles. And the controls had to be programmed to handle that. Another one was that we needed to measure remaining power since it would run for eight hours specifically and then need to be refueled or recharged. So I need the controls to add cord to that. Another one was the vehicle needed to cover the entire operating field without missing space. So you miss space, then there could be a mine that's down there that you don't know about. And then the last one we wrote was they had to compensate for the trail of turning because it wouldn't be accurate sharp turns with something following it. Those are all very good. May I, may I keep that? Sure. Okay, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to uh, scan it in tonight in the scanner and then so you'll get a copy of it that way. Okay, all right, thank you. Next. Uh, we said the system shall use a some sort of required controller. You weren't sure which one? An X controller, I see. Yeah, it's black, now. it's top secret. <laughs> The system, is that because it's, uh, you can't tell me or you have to kill me? I, I don't know what it is yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, the system shall operate within the military standards. Uh, the system shall be contained in a waterproof vehicle. The control system shall not be disturbed by the detection sensors. The control system shall be compatible with the necessary sensors. The control system shall function in a radioactive environment. Ah. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, can I have that too? Or, 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 uh, or, okay, I'll take that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll hold it. That means you're missing a page of your notes. I'll have it for you next, uh, on, uh, <coughs> Monday. So you can study for a moment. So, I have pretty much beat systems engineering in requirements to a, uh, to a, uh, uh, a pulp. So, uh, I think, uh, we've pretty much done everything there that we would, uh, that we need to do. So, any other questions about systems engineering? All right, thank you very much. All right, introduction to robotics. Today I'm going to cover some concepts of motion. And this was one of the, uh, one of the topics that I kind of quizzed you on in a quiz. So let's uh, see if we can do this operation ourselves. But this has to do with gearing. So our, uh, our wonderful uh, friends in mechanical engineering may have a, a, an up on this. So let's take a look at this. Let's say we have a, a motor. And based on the motor, we're going to have a conversion of 52 53 revolutions of the motor is going to be equal to one revolution of a wheel. So how would that, uh, how would you get 53 revolutions suddenly come up with one revolution of the wheel? What is that called? Gear radiation. All right, that is called gearing and a gear ratio. So my question to you would be, let's set up a problem. If the wheel has a 10 centimeter diameter, and you want to travel 100 centimeters, how many revolutions of the motor are needed? Fifty-three to one. Fifty-three to one. Are you sure? 
I said the diameter. Be about 159. So does everybody know how to set up this problem? Should I do it once just to see what would happen? Yes, no? All right, let's take a look at this. First of all, what we are saying is that if you're going to travel 100 centimeters, you know that you're going to travel a certain number of revolutions of your wheel. And, and what is the circumference of the wheel? 31.4. So it's 2 pi r or pi d. So the circumference is going to be 31.4 centimeters. I'll just go to that far, right? So obviously, to travel 100 centimeters, one revolution of the wheel is going to be equal to 31.4 centimeters. We also know that one revolution of the wheel is equal to 53 revolutions of the motor. So the answer is going to be 5300 divided by 31.4 Four, which is what? Anybody with a calculator handy? 169. 169. Is that because you did it already? Yes. Or are you just that smart? Well, both, because if I did it already, then. Oh, you're trying to be humble, right? <laughs> One thing I need to uh, point out is that just like uh, when I was a kid, I learned you have to make sure that all the uh, units cancel out too, right? So we have centimeters cancel out, wheel revolutions cancel out. So it turns out to be that we're left with 169 revolutions of the wheel. Motor. 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 Easy enough, right? So now let's look at another problem. Dr. Conrad. Yes, sir. So that gear ratio would be 53 to 1. Is that what the gear ratio would actually be? Yes. Okay, 53 to 1. That means that, that the last spindle all the way at the end that actually is attached directly to the motor is going to resolve, revolve one time, one revolution, with 53 revolutions of that, that motor. So when you give a gear ratio, the first number is always the motor turn, the second number is always the wheel turn? It depends on who's doing it. Let's see our mechanical engineers. Oh, they disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, we have four mechanical engineers, five in here, right? Is that right? Is that what you usually see for gear ratios, Emmys? Uh, I usually see it on paper, and it just says which one it's talking about. Okay. So it specifies. Yeah. So in, in this problem, notice I said 53 motor revolutions to one wheel revolution. So I was specific. And so if I were to give an exam with a question on an exam, I would make sure that I specified that. You never know when something like this might actually show up on a quiz on Monday. So the, the lab is not due Monday. The lab is not due Monday, correct. Squirrel. So here is the next problem, which you're going to, we're going to pause the, uh, pause, no, no, not yet, not yet. I'm going to give the problem and let you, let you do it first. So people watching this out there can say, oh, what was that? All right, so. So again, the, uh, the motor revolution ratio is uh, motor 53 revs equates to a wheel with one revolution. We have a robotic vehicle
like this. Okay? The width of the uh, of the robot is 30 centimeters. And I'll count that at uh, one wheel to the next. And our circumference, I'm sorry, our uh, diameter of the wheel is going to be seven centimeters. And I'll declare this the center of my robot. So if I want my robot to rotate 180 degrees in place, how many revolutions of the motor is needed? Seems easy enough, right? So, let's pause and give you some time to work on it. Just kidding. Oh, you don't want this one. Are you okay? All right, we're starting up? Yeah. All right, so um, I had some notes and I'm just hoping I get these right. So let me check this out. So, maybe I should say, what is the distance traveled? Well, we're basically going in a circle, right? Half a circle. Half a circle. So it's going to be pi d, or 30 pi. Uh, it's going to be pi d over 2, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so we're only going half of it. All right. So we are going 15 pi centimeters. Then again, very similar to what we had before. We have our. Uh, our circumference of the wheel, and what's our circumference of the wheel? So we're going to get seven pi. Oh, hold on. that's where I said it. Oh, that's where I was wrong. Okay. Yeah, it's seven pi. And that's going to be equal to one wheel rev. And then, of course, one wheel rev is going to be 53 motor revs times two motors. <laughs> the assumption is they're both traveling in the same direction, right? So this is, this is the rev for each individual motor. But both of them will have to do it. And then the answer of this turned out to be, what was that, 113? Yeah, 113 and a half. 113.5 <laughs> motor revs. Uh, I, I was a little bit messed up because uh, um, my notes said the wheel radius was 7, not the diameter was 7 centimeters. So I was a little bit messed up. Sorry about that. So the person out there, I corrected that it was my mistake. So the remaining thing to think about is if your vehicle has uh, seven 
trying to think is it, it's about seven centimeters for our, our little uh, digital vehicle, right? Is that about how big the uh, the wheels were? Let's say let's just call it seven centimeters diameter. <coughs> Wheels. How many wheel or how much how many motor revolutions? To uh, traverse a one meter by one meter square. So rather than going through this or having you go through this on your own and then coming back uh, and, and looking at this, I will leave this to a uh, at-home exercise. You never know when something like this might show up on a quiz. Question? We need to know the width of the vehicle or we assume that's 30 centimeters? Oh square. yeah, the uh, vehicle width is... Uh, is uh, 30 centimeters. You're traversing a square. You're doing if you're square. traversing a square, you have to turn, right? And also assume... Uh, or we assume you're going to the lawn the entire way around. Yes, you make, uh, you make uh, four turns and drive straight otherwise. <laughs> the gear is just a 53 to 1. Yeah, 53 to 1 gear ratio. All right. Any other questions? We'll talk. Are you talking about a standard turn, or are you talking about going up pivot turn? Pivot turn. So no Ackerman steering. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>